What's up, y'all? Coach here, and I'm coming to you talking about the new codex, the Imperial Knights. I just got this the other day, and I went through it, and I just want to do a quick review, uh, give you what I think about it, go over it a little bit, and see how we can get this into the game. All right, so let's let's get going. All right, guys. So um, I don't have a Knight Titan per se yet. I didn't I didn't purchase one yet, but I did purchase the codex. So um, I'm just going to go with the, the White Dwarf Weekly Pictures and uh, give you that as a background. But what happens is, in this book, there's about 115 pages of fluff. And what the fluff does is it tells you about the history of the Knights and, uh, you know, their legacies and whatnot. And it also goes through what they're all about, which is basically their Knights, kind of like medieval Knights. And the houses on certain planets are knightly houses and they have various heraldry and different types of um, suits that they wear and some of them are you know with the Imperium of Man some of them are aligned with Mars and you know the, uh, the priests of Mars and there are some uh, knights which are called free blades who are kind of like uh, not for the um, Mechanicum, or they're not for the uh, the um, uh, Imperium. They're kind of on their own, and it seems like they can be hired out. And uh, you know, um, they kind of lead to. They would go to different legions, or they would help out, or stuff like that. They might even kind of hint. You know, I, I got a feeling from reading the fluff about that they might go with, say, Tau or Chaos or something like that. You know, who whoever's got the. Uh, the best price and the best incentive for them to go with. So they're basically mercenaries. And, you know, it goes over the history, certain things like, you know, the Black Crusade, and there's a lot of heraldry and different things. And, you know, you, I guess you get, when you get the model, you get the decals and you put them on. So that's about 115 pages of fluff. Now, when you get a codex and you get tons of fluff in it, it's kind of like, oh man, where's the rules? Where's this and that? But I got to tell you, I really, really enjoyed reading the rules and reading the fluff. And um, it's because they're kind of an old thing that GW's bringing back, and I didn't really know much about it. So now by reading this, I really like the way they went about it, and I like what they did. And it's really a good read. So if you do pick up the Codex, definitely read the fluff. The fluff kind of gets you psyched, and it gets you thinking about what you'd like to paint them as and what different heraldry you want to put on, your decals and whatnot. So it's definitely read. I definitely say that you read it. All right, here we go, guys. Let's get into some of the rules. Um, these guys are super heavy walkers, and basically they're going to have all the rules from the 40K rule book as what a super heavy walker is. Um, they can move 12 inches in the movement phase which is uh, pretty good, you know, because they're big, so they can get across the field. So it makes them pretty mobile. Shooting, you know, when a Super Heavy Walker makes a shooting attack, it may fire each of his weapons at different targets if desired. So in addition to fighting ordnance weapons, has no effect on the Super Heavy Walker's ability to fire other weapons. Note, however, that Super Heavy Walkers may not fire Overwatch. So basically, uh, you could shoot every single weapon on your Super Heavy Walker, on your Knight, at a different target. So they basically have a built-in split fire rule for everything. So that's pretty cool. Um, now their vehicle damage is different. The Super Heavy Walker is so large that it has such a formidable damage control system that the effects of crew shake and stun immobilize are destroyed or basically they're ignored. So you really gotta pound the hell out of this thing. In addition, every time a Super Walker explodes and suffers a, a, an explode, so basically get a roll six. Um, on the vehicle damage chart, it loses 3-3 hull points instead of suffering the effects listed. So they won't be crew shake and crew stun. If you happen to get an explode, you roll a d3, you subtract that from their hull points. And that's about it. Each glancing and penetrating hit. All right? And they have their own vehicle damage table, which is a super heavy walking vehicle damage table. Now, if on, it's basically an easy damage, you know, if you explode or another result, Basically, you lose uh, D3 hull points. If it's another result, anything but an explosion, you're not going to lose any hull points. So that's basically the super heavy vehicle damage chart. All 
Now here's where the craziness happens. The catastrophic damage chart or damage table. Basically, if you lose all your hull points, you got to roll a d6. On a 1, it's an explosion. Now check this out. It's strength. You have your template. It's that, that apocalyptic template. And basically, the explosion on a 1, the inside is a d. Then the second one is 4, strength 4, and then strength 2, AP 2, 4, and 6. If it's a 2 to 3, it's a devastating explosion. Basically, strength D, 8, and then 4, and AP 2, 3, and 5. If it's 4 to 6, you got what's called a titanic explosion, which uh, it's a D in the middle, strength 10, and strength 5, and basically 2, 3, and 4 AP. So it's, it's huge. It really is a, a, a catastrophic attack. Now, another cool attack that the uh, walkers have is the stomp. So the super heavy walkers engaged in combat may take a special type of attack called the stomp attack. The stomp attack is made in addition to the super heavy walkers' normal attack. Stomp attacks are resolved during the sub-fight in the initiative one step. This does not grant the model an addition pilot move in initiative step one. So basically, what happens is you're going to roll a d3, and you're going to get to basically pick up your leg and smash and stomp the hell out of the enemy that's in front of you. Okay? So the first one has to be on the model's base. And each unit, un, you know, at least one model, even partially under it, the walker is stomp. For each unit, stomp, roll, and stomp table. Each subsequent stomp is made in the same manner, except that the blast marker does not have to be placed touching the super heavy walker. Instead, it's placed so it's at least within three inches of where the last bar marker is. So you put your template down, you stomp there, that's the one by the base. Then you can go three to three inches in any direction from there and stomp right there. Okay? Uh, you know, we assume that it stomps and ends up where it started. So basically, you know, you don't move the walker, you just kind of stomp, stomp, and he's back in place. But the only thing is building flyers, swooping, swooping flying monstrous creatures, gargantuan creatures, flying gargantuan creatures, super heavy vehicles, super heavy walkers, and super heavy flyers cannot be stomped. So they don't, you know, basically you can't hit them with a blast marker, so you can't stomp on them. Now here's the thing, when you stomp, you got to roll a d6 for every time. On the one, no effect, being stomped. Basically, uh, you know, they moved out of the way. On a vehicle, no effect also. Two to five non-vehicles, crunch. Each model from the unit being stomped that is even partially under the blast marker of a strength 6 AP4 hit. On a vehicle, it's called Curse Smash. The vehicle being stomped suffers a penetrating hit. Number six, this is the one you want. Over on each model for under the target that is even partially in the blast marker is removed from play. And the vehicle is flipped. The vehicle being stomped scatters D6 inches, then suffers and explodes and results from the vehicle damage table. So that's pretty cool. You stomp on it and you kind of mess it up. Alright, so let's talk about their special rules. Well, the super heavy walkers have the following special rule. They got fear, hammer of wrath, move through cover, relentless, smash, and strike down. They are also invincible behemoths, which I said before. Basically, an invincible behemoth is a super heavy walker, is so large and strongly built that weapons that degrade the armor of smaller vehicles will not, will not affect it. Because of this, any attack that says that the target model is destroyed, wrecked, explodes, or is otherwise removed from play inflicts D3 hull points of damage on a super heavy walker instead. In addition, any attacks or special abilities that permanently lower the armor value of a target vehicle do not affect super heavy walkers. Note that attacks or abilities that count as armor value as being lower do not actually, actually change it work normally. So basically, you're not going to degrade the armor of a super heavy walker. Alright, so let's talk about destroyer weapons. Check out that big chainsaw right there. That's the D weapon that the knights bring to the table. Alright, so basically you're going to you're gonna, uh, do your close combat attack with that and then you're going to have the D weapon, which is a destroyer weapon. So now, uh, you have to roll on a chart to see what happens, okay? So you roll a D6, and this is for a vehicle or building. On a 1, it is clipped. The target suffers a penetrating hit. On a 2 to a 5, it's called a solid hit. The super heavy walker loses... This, I'm sorry, super he, a super heavy vehicle loses 
D3 plus one hull points. Other vehicles suffer and explodes, result from the vehicle damage table. Building suffering a definition results from the building damage table. Number six, this is the one you want, the devastating hit. For a solid hit above, except a super heavy vehicle loses D6 plus six hull points instead. So basically, if you get hit with this, your Rhino, your Land Raider, it's just gonna it's just gonna blow up if you know it, it's it's a solid hit, it's gonna you're gonna lose all its hull points in one shot, you know, instead of it stating hit. So on the non vehicles, basically these are your guys. Lucky escape, the model's unharmed on a one. On a two to five, it's serial, seriously wounded. The model loses D3 plus one wounds. And number six, you roll a six, the death blow. The model loses D6 plus six wounds. So basically, you know, you're going to take out monstrous creatures. You're going to do all that, uh, you know, damage to them. But you're going to roll on the chart, the D chart. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. That's, you know, what they, what they have here. Okay, so let's talk about the knights already. This is the Knight Paladin, okay, 375 points. And like I said before, you know, they have all the special rules and, you know, they're a super heavy walker. Now, what makes him so special? Well, here's his war gear. He has two heavy stubbers, which are basically 36 inch range, strength four, AP six, heavy three. So you're getting six shots out of that, which is not bad. Then he's got the big rapid fire battle cannon. 72 inch, strength 8, AP 3, ordinance 2, large blast. So that's pretty cool. That's a, a, a nice, strong, um, you know, battle. it's a battle cannon, rapid fire battle cannon. So you're going to be able to shoot pretty good. The Reaper Chainsword. Now, this is a melee weapon, so you got to use it in close combat. Strength D, AP 2. So that's basically the armament of this bad boy right here. Uh, this is the Knight Paladin, okay? Also, both knight, you know, knights have what's called the ion shield. So you have to say that I'm going to turn my ion shield on. You've got to say where it is, front, side, or back. And basically, that gives the knight a 4 plus in vulnerable saves on, against all hits facing that at the start of your opponent's next shooting phase. So basically, you're going to get an ion shield, a 4 plus in vulnerable save against shooting. So um, it might not, it, you know, it's only against shooting not against uh, saving throws against close combat attacks. So basically you gotta choose which direction you're gonna shoot your ion shield at and that's gonna help you get a four plus invulnerable save. But basically weapon skill four, ballistic skill four, strength 10, front armor is 13, side and rear is 12, initiative four, tax three, six hull points. All right, let's talk about the next knight, which is the knight errant. So basically, the same stats, weapon skill 4, ballista skill 4, strength 10, front armor is 13, side and rear is 12, initiative 4, tax 3, 6 hull points, just like the knight, uh, the paladin. The only thing is, is he is only 370 points, but he has one less heavy stubber. So he has one heavy stubber, he has the reaper chain sword, he has the ion shield, and all the same special rules. The difference is is to you see to the left is the thermal cannon. Now this is a 36 inch range, strength 9, AP1, heavy 1, large blast melter, which is uh, pretty strong, you know, that's a really really strong, I mean large blast melter is a big, uh, big strong weapon, strength 9, AP1, so you could do a lot of damage with that. You could take out some tanks, you could take out some buildings, you could take out a whole crap ton of infantry. But he is, uh, like I said, five points less. So those are the two Titans that you would be able to field. So now what I'd like to do is get into uh, some of the other rules that are left in the book. All right, so let's talk about what if you want to field just a bunch of Imperial Knights? What if you want to use them as, say, a primary? And you, and you can all right, so they give you the rules for this. So basically, if you take them as a primary detachment of up to three to six Imperial Knights, if you do so, one must be your Warlord, and you have to roll on the chart for that. But basically, no other restrictions apply. Other detachments, such as additional primary detachments, allied detachments, or fortifications, we can take them as normally. In addition, Imperial Knight Army, the Imperial Knights are scoring units. So these are big guys sitting on top of... Uh, 
sitting on top of objectives. And you know what? Uh, I've seen that some guys, what they do is they measure out, have them sit on top of an objective, and you can't get within three inches of that objective because the, the thing is so close. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the base is so big, so it's hard for you to get there. you got to basically destroy them to get on the, on the objective. And you have to do nightly ranks. So a player who wants to include knight's appearance or send shells in their games must roll a dice for their knight errant or knight paladin. Or the, other than the warlord, at the same time they determine the warlord traits. And refer to the nightly rank table below to see what the rank of the knight is. So basically, you're going to roll on the uh, nightly rank table. Now, your warlord is going to be, if you roll a 6, which is ascensional. Add one to the knight's weapon skill and ballista skill. In addition, a knight's sentinel's iron shield converts a three plus in volume stave instead of a four plus. Now, that's awesome if you can roll that twice or three times. But you have to roll to see what the rank is of your other two dudes. So the first one is basically he becomes a knight apparent. You roll a one. Subtract one from the knight's weapon skill and ballistic skill. In addition, the knight apparent's iron shield conserves. Uh, confers a 5 plus instead of a 4 plus in vulnerable save. So that kind of stinks. All right, so you're going to get l one less uh, weapon skill, one less ballistic skill, and you're going to have a 5 plus in vulnerable instead of the 4. That's if you roll a 1. If you roll a 2 to 5, standard games apply. So all weapon skill, everything's the same, 4 plus iron, and then 6 is ascensional. We get a plus 1 ballistic, plus 3 weapon, and a four plus, uh, 3 plus in vulnerable save. Okay, so let's talk the Warlord traits. Now, if you roll a 1, you are the master of the hunt. The Knight Warlord and all friendly Imperial Knights within 12 inches of them add 1 to the result when rolling the distance they run or they charge range. So, I, I don't know about the run range, but the charge range, you know, you get a plus 1 to it. So, you can move, uh, you know, one extra one extra inch, which is which could be good, I guess, with these guys so being so big. Number 2, Fearsome Reputation. Enemy units within 12 inches of the Knight Warlord must use the lowest leadership value and not the highest. Number three, you are the master of the joust. The knight warlord rerolls failed to hit rolls in the assault phase in which he successfully charges into close combat. Okay, it's not too bad. Master of the field, the knight warlord and up to D3 friendly imperial knights have the outflank special rules. That's the master of the field. That's a good one. Imagine these guys outflanking. Uh, you know, at least, you know, one to three of them, that would be pretty nasty in the backfield. Number five is the Master of Siege. The Knight Warlord and all friendly Imperial Knights within 12 inches of him add one to the rolls they make on the building damage table. Eh, that's all right. Number six, you're indomitable. The Knight Warlord has the Able Not Die special rule. That's the one. So I'm thinking Master of the Field, which makes you outflank D3 units, an Indomitable, where the Night Warlord has the Will Not Die special. That's pretty good. So that looks like uh, like uh, the two that you really want to go for. The other ones are pretty much, they're all right. They're not, they're not great. Nothing to write home about. But, uh, you know, those two are really what you really want. Then at the end of the book here, you seems to be with all the data slates now. They're just giving you a glossary of all the special rules. And basically, it's a quick reference. So instead of flipping through the book, you go through the back all the different special rules, uh, all your charts, and all that different thing. So instead of looking through the book again, you just kind of look on that. Okay, guys, so what do you think? Well, I really, really, really like these models. I think that they are very cool. I think that this is a uh, cool way to get Titans into the regular 40K game. And honestly, for the points and what they bring to the table, they're basically, points-wise, they are priced accordingly, I think. I think that you can bring one of them, two of them, and not be too overpowered. But you are dropping 375 points into them. I mean, it's more than a Land Raider. It's, uh, you know, it's 100 points over anything else. But... They are extremely cool to play with. Uh, we haven't used them yet. We haven't play tested them yet. But it seems like a lot of fun. We're going to try to do this. We're going to try to get some night, um, some night models, and also you know we can proxy some things just to check them out to see if they're worth it. So in the future we'll have some battle reports with that. You know, stay tuned for that. But I think that uh, running one or two of them might not be terrible. Just as something cool to bring something. 
with a lot of firepower. As far as maybe playing them as a primary, I don't know. I don't know. It, it might be cool, but then again, you know, I'm spending $140 per model. You got to take three to six. So once I sell my car, I can get a bunch of a uh, bunch of these night models. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, we all know what this hobby's about, and it would be kind of cool to feel just six of these guys and wreck face and go to town with them. But how really feasible is that? How really? How is that gonna transform into the game? Are they that sturdy? I mean. I watched a, a battle report the other day, and by turn two, a bunch of melters blew it up and had a catastrophic explosion. So, you know, 375 points, 370 points, you bring it in, and something de-stressed behind it with a bunch of melter or even some las guns, you might be in for a shock. You know, you might have a catastrophic explosion. But then again, you know, you take a land raider. You take a Rhino, you take anything, you take Marnius Augustus Calgar, you take, you know, some of these big HQs that are a lot of money, and they can get sniped out or killed in the first round, which is horrible, but that's why I play the game. So, in my humble opinion, and it's just my humble opinion, I really kind of like these things. You know, I like to see them with some of my forces of the Empire, uh, the Imperium, you know, with my Grey Knights or my Inquisition or Legion of the Damned or my Ultramarines. Let's get out there and play with them. I, I think this is, this is really a good one. And I got to tell you, I really like this codex. A lot of good fluff, a lot of good rules, ridiculous amounts of pictures and whatnot. And then the White Dwarves, they actually have the paint splatter that are actually pretty good that help you to learn how to paint these. And they even have a thing on how to put them together, how to glue them, how not to glue them. And I know GW put up a bunch of different building videos on how to build these Night Titans. So, um, guys, my humble opinion, I really like them. I think I might pick up two of them, or maybe three of them, and feel them in the army. I look forward to painting them. I don't know what color scheme, you know, because uh, the blue guy in front of you with all the Ultramarines there kind of is inspiring to me, kind of draws me to it, but I'm not sure. But, like I said, I really like this codex. I like the direction that this particular... Titans are going, and this is a way to get mini Titans into the game because everybody wanted to play with Titans, but you can't really bring a Warhound Titan or an Emperor Class Titan into a regular 40k game without going into an Apocalypse game. So this is a nice little transition that brings it in. So um, I'm going to say from the debacle of the Legion of the Damned Codex, I think this was a nice little bounce back, and this is a very good Codex. I would recommend it. So that's it, guys. That's my two cents. That's my uh, humble opinion. And we're going to close this one out. So if you can, leave me a comment below. And if you like this video, just hit that thumbs up button. And if you haven't subscribed, just check out some of our old videos. You know, we got some craziness going on. And I'd like to see uh, some new guys and some new comments out there. So like I said, guys, like, rate, comment, subscribe. And I'll see you, all you Wargamers in the next one. Take care.